Come on, tarnish any with weapon. I brought the weapon you were looking for. They're old, all right. But this isn't what I was expecting. I don't suppose you figured out what was supposed to make them so special. Yeah, I, I do. But uh, I wasn't going to kill that guy just because you wanted to do that. Uh, thing with them used to fill them with fragments of their own essence. He take them. He stares at the rusty's weapons in horror and disgust. If I'd known, I'll see that someone disposes of this perversion. What a wonder the Glafafans don't want you lot digging around those ruins if you're only going to destroy whatever you find. Look now, you have me sympathizing with them. At least I don't have to waste any more expeditions on this. If the knights make a move, we'll just have to face them down with old fashioned deer wooden metal. Hopefully, you can avoid a conflict. They ask for trouble? Well, there'll be no answers. Speaking of the knights, uh, I hear you had a running with a patrol at Stormborn Gorge. Yes, I did. You don't seem surprised. He looks at you clear now. It might be I sent them your way. You then to turn your attention away from the city for a while. Now they'll be doubling and tripling those patrols. There's reckoning coming when those hearings end. Folks have had it with their legacy. They've had it with soul butchers angering the gods. The, that the Duke would stop them. I'll be the effigy if the good people of Deerwood don't see it as themselves. And the dozens lead the charge. Okay. Bailey Gwyner's golden eyes narrow and she gives you a sidelong glance, shaking her head in disapproval. Links are with the Duke on this. If he decides wrong, they'll be in our way and just making preparations. A lopsided grin spreads across his face. I know you'll do well. Don't hold it against me. I think started out just like you. Mind that you don't turn. Yeah. Be sure of that. All but justice. Uh, he slaps on your shoulder. Anyway, I owe you one. I want you to take my old war bow. It's a trusted piece. But I won't be sniping in the shadows when Defiance Bay has need of us. No hard feelings, I hope. If there's anything else I can do for you, just let me know. With a dozen extraordinary Defiance Bay in the model. Okay. We need someone to help us seek an audience with the Duke. But the dozens are little more than a mob. Uh, common people, dicks organized maybe, but still people, that doesn't make that sense. Uh, At least with the Dominaires we can be confident that the bloodshed will be minimal. Can we? I thought I killed them all. <clears throat> can we? The streets won't run red. The Dominaires can be violent, but always with a goal in mind. They're certainly no friends to me or the Republics, but their motives are easy to understand. Okay, okay. Oh, it's automatically. An elf idles by the road, watching the village across the river. He nods at you approach, and a cowled figure standing near him falls silent. Good day to you. Thank you. A slow smile forms as he eyes you. I've heard of you. Word has it that you've been busy in Divine Bay. He draws closer. I'm busy too, and eager to finish my business and go back to the city. What business is that? Haven't you heard? There's a murderer on the loose. Said they have gone mad with grief and strangled a dozen healthy children with her own. With her own was hollow bone. He nods at the figures with him. The fall come all the way from Defy Spray to bring her justice to her. Uh, <clears throat> she's here. He nods across the river. She's hiding out in the village. We go in after her ourselves, but the problem is she knows our faces. There's no telling what she'd do if she saw us coming. And we'd like to avoid any further unnecessary bloodshed. Aileen's closer. Her name's Nef Nefri. He's an Orlin. We want to get her out of town so that we can deal with her cleanly. She knows we're looking for her, but if someone were to convince her that it's safe to leave. <laughs> if 
She's a murderer, why didn't the Duke send his Christmas nights after him? The powers, that, the powers that be want to keep things quiet, for obvious reasons, better not to, better not to cause a fuss and certainly better not to settle her into doing something drastic. I'm not sure about this. A bad woman like that is everybody's problem, friend. Just keep an eye out. If you come across her, remember what I told you. I promise I'll make it worth your while. Sorry, <laughs> little woman. How do you do? Uh, why did the Nathan do exactly? She was responsible for the murders of all those babies in Defiance Bay, remember? Terrible thing. Well, yeah, it's terrible, but you, you all wanted it and then you moaned that it happened. Hey, you've only got yourself to blame. Not very quiet. Not very quiet. Golden celery, eh? Let me in, let me in. Not on the hills of my chinny chin chin. I'll stay out of sight. He'll bring a beard in. Out with you! I already told you what. I'm sorry. I thought you were one of those ruffians. Immigrants. Boys. These things are relevant, yep. How may I help you? Eh, hey, what happened to you? I never saw their faces. Strange hooded men asking about those ruins. Cleoban Relog. Most of the brigands who come through here asking about the ruins are looking for a few ancient trinkets. But these people knew the name, and they were in a hurry. They wanted to know where Cleoban Relog was. I tried to keep it from them, but I couldn't hold out forever. I don't know what they were up to, but it can't be good. Can you tell me where to find the ruins? The Glanfarthen tribe that guards the ruins <clears throat> will kill anyone who trespasses there. And they'll retaliate against us, too, if history is any indication. We've had too many fortune seekers stir up trouble of late. If I'm to tell you, I'll need to know your reason for wanting to go. It here. It's not. It's Havaris. He folds his arms and stares at you with one eye and skull. So this is where I say, go into the ruins and I'll kill you. And that's when you say, Havaris, I'm a watcher and you're not so much for all of us. And we've got a good reason for this. And then I give up trying to argue with you and leave you to dig your own trespasser's grave. And I'm only being half metaphoric, but we sometimes mark the wooden dig your own grave before we kill you. When the kids hear about it's a fabulous deterrent. Hmm. He does have some understanding that it is going to be dangerous. But I promise the deer. It's a dangerous plot. A dangerous plot is evolving here. I've got to stop it. If that's the case. Then we may already have trouble headed our way. I'll have to take you at your word. You'll find Cleoban Relog here. Whatever trouble you find there, please end it quietly and try to stay out of the ruins. Which means we're definitely going into the ruins. Uh, folk here tend to keep to themselves, so as they do in most towns this deep in Deerwood, they're suspicious of travellers. But with all the brigands and refugees moving through the area, who can blame them? It's, it's a temple of Beref. What can you tell me about it? Beref is the most universal for all the gods. It overseers portals and cycles of all kinds, even life and death itself. Under Beref, an, endless, an ending is merely a passage to another beginning. Beref has many representations across time and across cultures. Around the Deerwood, you'll commonly see it depicted as a pallid knight or the usher, the 
Grafafen Tower, known it as Beonine, by Akron, and Akron and Bunine. Okay, tell me about the Palace Knight. He's one of the youngest manifestations of Bereth, but a familiar one nevertheless. Stories describe her as a gaunt knight in black armour with black eyes, black hair, and milk pale skin. She demands an impossible toll for travellers who have tarried too long on our Lord's road. Some challenge her only to slay themselves in the process. Who is the Usher? Kef have written stories, songs and poems about the Usher for centuries. Sometimes he spoke, sometimes dwarf, sometimes merely a walking skeleton. He, he never speaks, but he guides the way to death and the next life. He also creates the circumstances for the wayward to stumble onto their own graves. Okay, I've never heard of the Beowin Akin and the Akin Beowin. It means life and death and death and life, respectively. You see them as two skeleton figures, one male, one female. Explorers have found them carved opposite one another in doorways, but I know of no particular legends that speak of them. Okay, okay. So now I can travel there. Happy days. God's key. Mm, text with relief as he looks at you. What are the odds stuck in this bath walker only to meet the famed champion of Defiance Bay? The ref's wheel brings mercy today indeed. His demeanour grows serious. Perhaps you could help. I don't suppose you saw a young elven noblewoman on the road. I'm stuck in this rich place for the rest of my unit until we find her. I haven't seen anyone like that. Same as everyone else in this blazing village. Perhaps you could speak to Lord Harlan in the inn anyway. He will be grateful for the assistance, and it could be the locals will open up to you about his daughter's disappearance more than they have us. Somebody's missing. Be cautious. Be constant. Hey. Mm -hmm. You got to say. Nothing, 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 shalala. A piglet. Ready, Watcher. This old aged peasant woman is dressed in a brown leather cloth draped down to her knees. Her hands are working as separated 
hand are working at separating stringy, colourless vegetables in a pile before her, stripping the heads off the long, fibrous stems of pairing wheat. She discards the stems one by one, placing the heads of the vegetables into a small cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you as you approach. You're not sure she even knows you're there. Excuse me. The woman doesn't respond. She keeps stripping the heads from the vegetables with a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she heard you. At first glance, at first glance she seems nothing more than a middle-aged woman. Unremarkable maybe less stern than most. She seems more focused on the weaving in her lap than her surroundings, yet you suddenly notice she's not stripping the vegetables before her any longer. She's weaving, and the vegetable pots are now missing. She still pays you no mind, her brown locks torn and snagged from lack of washing, like many of the townsfolk you've seen. There's a strange blur to her face, to her, even the motions of her hands seem to be playing with threads that lack colour, a shape that lacks interest. It may be that she is half-minded or deaf, but something feels wrong. As you watch, her knitting takes on an odd cadence, and you have a terrible suspicion that something lurks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Her brown hair is long, almost impossibly at to the length of her hands, as you follow the stems of her locks downwards, the hairs become long and black, splitting off into threads of black and silver, and wrapping around her hands. She is forming a soul cradle with the threads, braiding a neat in front of you, each finger long and sharp, like a series of knitting needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and black strands of her hair weave together, with silver prim dominating as a highlight the black shadowing it. And suddenly, you are calm. You are on a plateau, almost the height of a tower, several stories high. The plateau is like a table lying beneath a clear sky, and beneath the plateau, surrounded in all directions, a forest, hazy with mist. Although, whatever it is, whatever it is actual mist or distance or a recollection, Resting in the curve of a natural arc above you is a great copper bell, half again the size of a man, hanging at attention, as if looking down on you and the event unfolding before you. The plateau has soaked in the sun, and the rock beneath you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. You feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body, your physical contours, have changed along with the surroundings and you hear a soft series of chimes, like wind chimes. At the sound, the scene gains colour and texture, as if the sound is beckoning you gently for, following your sense and thoughts, like mist rolling softly into a sealed chamber. And... The chime coaxes you deeper into the memory, and you're certain it is a memory, a warm one. You are on the stone of the plateau, your knees on the warm texture of the ground, Silver, white, shimmering like Adra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrists, your hands. Your hands are in motion. Weaving, not thread, but gathering, tenderly moving along the first movements of Beres' wheel. Your hands are wet. Your hands are upon the flesh of a newborn child and can and you can feel the crowning of a tiny head, turning it in your grip, its head slick, wet from the wound. The hands you are wearing inhabitably have done this many times, and they are practiced and confident. You can feel distant pains in your own head as the head emerges, a stem of fluid from the womb helping the newborn, newborn slide forth, and a woman's laboring labouring breathing, crying out. Focus on the church. Focus on the child, the movement of your hands. As your hands move, you hear the sound of chimes, clear, cutting through the haze of memory. You cannot see where they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as, com as a comfort. Of that you are certain. So 
So you coax with your hands every movement causing the chimes to sound again. Almost eagerly, the child comes forth, and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of a soft, wet rope, no, an umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. You are holding a small child, still wet from the wound, before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul, the ringing of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with, with its welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges, and if you are viewing a soul from within a soul, but there it is, it is alive. The woman before you is weeping, and at her first cry, her hands reach out for it. Surrender the, surrender the child. Oh, great. You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before. And as your hands move, the chimes echo the movement, and you realise the chimes are hanging from cords on your wrists. And where once the echo and echoed in the memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child, to be its first gentle greeting into the world, a soothing sing, sound, guided by the tender motions of your wrists. You are helping to weave its thoughts, its perceptions, and the experience. The experience. The woman laughs with a ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat. Her emotions seem soothed, but the physical demands of labour have left her exhausted. But the child is here, the child is safe, and all atop the plateau is peaceful, calm, distant, flattering out as the memory persists. Slowly pull back, retreat from the memory. With effort, the scene bleeds out of colour, and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet the sound of the chimes remain. As they existed in the memory, they sound here as well, and they are hanging from woven braids on the wrist of the woman before you. Even as your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, the sound of the chimes on her wrist is sharp and clear as if coaxing you back to the real world. The woman still sits before you, but she is nothing like what you saw. She is wearing black, shreddy garments that drape over her from form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, like a crumpled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you see that her hair is draped across the front of her face, like a veil. When you saw first saw of her was a mental glamour of some sort, unconscious, and you realise what you see is not what the world sees and you are perhaps the first to see her true self. Still you don't sense a threat in the re realisation, if anything you feel a sense of relief from the figure, you can hear her thoughts and she is glad to at, al and she is glad to at last be seen. What did you do to I'm me? I am seen but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There is a light torch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the torch. Reaching up to the air between you, you hear the chime of her wrist sound. Softly, her hand moves as if, as if pantomining resting on your cheek at a distance, and she speaks softly, softly and slowly. Cadence of wheels on a caravan track. Fever. Questions by running water. Violence in a night's campfire. Arrows in the dark. And fleeing. Falling rock and cracking stone. And a storm. Storm. A storm that brushed you. Did its screaming wake you from your mind's cradle? Your memory of it is painful. Its cry is difficult to ignore. It's like a child. Many children crying out. <clears throat> I can go straight into that one, but...
I don't believe in bioworks, but I'll go with that one. Her hand withdraws shyly, the chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands, uncertainly, uncertainly, as if she has been sitting for some time, or is too weak to bear her own weight. You notice her cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt, yet while her stance is weak, she seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It is almost a question. You suddenly realise she doesn't seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. The image on the plateau, yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you're surprised she didn't feel you there. To see me is a rare gift, a watcher's gift. Uh, I've never been able to do that with a loving person. Well, technically we can. So many questions. Thoughts whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you, deep beneath your thoughts, yet muted and secret, like an underground river. I cannot tell if it is carving new channels or eroding what keeps your true strength buried. The fact that you could hear it at all, survive it, is something few have ever done. Your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch, as it allowed you to reach out to mine. There's a silence. I know it seems to last but for a heartbeat. In your thoughts, it stretches out between the two of you, like a pool between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and then you realise she wants to ask you a question. You can't form the words, as if assembling them is painful, or there simply are not enough pieces. Assemble the thoughts. Do you wish to travel with me? You feel a wave of fear, gusted with the strength of relief. Although, oddly, her expression does not change. Then fear dissipates, and you feel strength uncertainly, as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you, and a calm sky looks down upon you. Alright, uh, okay. Gores. We'll have to bring her back. Turn of the grieving mother's past. Gonna be a warm one, isn't it? 